Good day, History 361. Um, so today we're going to step away from our narrative of military and political affairs um, and shift to examining uh, aspects of culture and society, especially in 5th century Athens, during the golden age of Athens. Um, today I want to talk about the development of dramatic performances um, and particularly the articulation of two genres of performance, tragedy and comedy. Um, now, way back at the start of this course, when we still did quaint things like gather together in a lecture hall, um, I made the argument that we should resist thinking about uh, the gifts of the Greeks, um, uh, and, and just to avoid fawning over the idea that the Greeks had given us so many wonderful things that formed the foundations for our Western civilization. Um, and I still basically feel that way. I, when we talk about tragedy and comedy today, I want to examine them very much in a historical context. That said, even someone as jaded as me will admit that there is a direct intellectual genealogy from Greek dramatic performances um, to uh, the kind of drama that you might now be uh, streaming via Netflix. Um, now, much of that is mediated in that, uh, say, Greek tragedies influenced Roman uh, uh, tragedians like Seneca, um, English tragedians during the Elizabethan era like Ben Jonson or William Shakespeare. They couldn't read Greek, but they could read Latin, so they were familiar with Latin tragedy. Um, and then certainly their plays, especially Shakespeare, has dramatically influenced what contemporary drama looks like. So while admitting that in some ways foundational uh, tragic poets like um, uh, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, um, certainly do have an impact on the nature of uh, Western drama. Um, what I really want to focus on is these plays being performed in their own time and context. Um, now, a key aspect of that context, and I think this is one way in which Athenian drama very much differs from the way you may be streaming Netflix tonight, um, is that it is performed in the context of a religious ritual. Um, when people go and sit down to watch a play or a series of plays, yes, they are out to have fun. Yes, they're out to, to, to enjoy the show, to recreate. Um, but they are also there to honor a god, to honor the god Dionys Dionysus. Um, and uh, these dramatic performances are simply one of a series of rituals that include processions and sacrifices um, that are to honor the god and his power. Um, so again, these plays are parts of religious rituals. Um, now, uh, Dionysus, among other things, is the god of wine, um, but maybe more importantly, he's overall the god of losing control. Of course, that's one reason he's the god of wine, I would suppose, um, that you drink wine and then you lose control and the inhibitions fall away. Um, but uh, Dionysus is about losing control more broadly. And in some ways, it is appropriate that first tragedy and then comedy is performed at these Dionysian festivals. Um, tragedy is very much about powerful people, frequently kings, heroes, um, who lose control of their situation. Um, and that is, is kind of, the, I might say that's kind of the basic plot of tragedy. Um, uh, and likewise, uh, comedy, and, and in this instance, it's, uh, the type of comedy we'll be talking about today is called old comedy, um, oftentimes involves riotous lampooning of powerful people. And in fact, if there's a if there's a kind of modern counterpart to what uh, old comedy in Athens looks like, I would actually suggest that Saturday Night Live. Not only are there a lot of sex jokes, poop jokes, adult humor, so to speak, um, uh, a lot of the comedic barbs are actually designed to um, uh, 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 attack powerful people, whether it's politicians or celebrities. Of course, today that those today those celebrities might be movie stars, singers, athletes. Um, uh, one of the celebrities that is attacked in, in old comedy um, is actually none other than Socrates. This Aristophanes writes an entire play about basically what a terrible idiot Socrates is. Um, but in some ways, these attacks on powerful people in the audience uh, 
pealing with laughter as they are kind of dragged through the satirical mud, um, represents in its own way a loss of control for both politicians and civic worthies who are, who are subject of this ridicule. And so equally, there's a kind of loss of control when comedy is performed. Both of these aspects are quite Dionysian. Um, so uh, again, importantly, this is a religious festival, um, and the, the plays are there as a way of honoring the god. Um, it's not unlikely, and there, you know, it's still debated um, uh, uh, just exactly how does Athenian tragedy develop. Um, many people would suspect that in some ways the origin of these uh, tragedies, because the tragedies do come first, the comedies are added somewhat later in the fifth century, the tragedies go all the way back to the time of uh, at the very latest, the tyrant Isostratus. Um, they may simply start out as actually kind of almost like pageant um, in, in the same way that you might go to a church on Christmas and watch a Christmas pageant that reenacts essentially a myth. Um, likewise, you might initially um, reenact with performers some aspect of a mythic scene, perhaps oftentimes a mythic scene involving Dionysus himself or a mythic scene involving other gods. And that sort of perhaps simple pageant, which initially may have had uh, virtually no dialogue, um, subsequently develops into more complex and more ambitious shows. Um, now, one question about the development of tragedy is, is this a democratic art form? And indeed, the kind of traditional view was it was, that tragedy uh, uh, manifests the sort of intellectual and artistic agency of the Athenian democracy, um, and that tragedy, uh, tragic performances should be seen as fundamentally democratic. Um, recently, people have taken uh, issue with this interpretation. And I think, I think that's probably correct. Um, for one thing, we have to remember tragedy, even though the tragedians do deal with many issues about um, uh, political power, about the agency of, of powerful people, about the uh, uh, claims of the community that they can make upon their leaders. I mean, these are all strands that I think you can certainly uh, are, are part of democratic debate, potentially. Um, but we also have to remember tragedy quite likely does not develop in the democracy at all, quite likely develops um, in the tyranny of Pisistratus and continues under his sons. And while Pisistratus in some ways is a kind of benevolent tyrant is probably the wrong characterization, um, but it's doubtful that he would have promoted an art form that he thought was somehow destabilizing to his rule and the ability of his sons to succeed him. He clearly doesn't think of tragedy as some kind of protest theater. Um, it's also important to note that while the production of tragedies is very much takes place in Athens, and I think there, it is driven by certain aspects of how the democracy can, can mobilize artistic production, promote artistic production, more on that in a bit, um, tragedy is very popular in places that are absolutely not democratic. The tyrants of Syracuse love tragedy and build a huge, magnificent theater um, where it can be performed. The kings of Macedonia love tragedy, and indeed, supposedly, the playwright Euripides dies while essentially he's artist in residence at the Macedonian court, at the court of this uh, fundamentally um, uh, uh, autocratic king. Um, so it, it's unclear to me that we should see tragedy itself as an inherently democratic genre. Um, and indeed, we should also remember that, that at times the Athenian democracy could be quite illiberal towards its artists. Um, while probably these plays had emerged as pageants, um, it wasn't necessarily guaranteed that most of the plots would only involve heroes and gods. Um, there were some attempts to produce plays that were contemporary, um, but these were extraordinarily rare. Um, so one play that was based on contemporary, contemporary events um, was a play produced after the failed Athenian expedition um, to intervene in the Ionian Revolt. Um, a playwright produced a play about the 
uh, sack of Miletus, the, the fact that the Persians had retaken um, the city that the Athenians had tried to aid. Supposedly, the Athenians are so distraught by being reminded of the blunder they had just committed that they find the playwright a talent of silver. And remember, a talent of silver is an extraordinary amount of money. It's roughly 60 pounds of silver. Um, it's many years worth of wages for the, the average Athenian. Um, and indeed, an event like this may explain why, for the most part, tragic poets stick to myth. Um, it's safer, um, and they don't want to necessarily uh, uh, you know, uh, activate the kind of illiberal ire of the demos. Um, now, there is one notable play that survived that is about a contemporary event that isn't mythic, um, and that is the play by Aeschylus, The Persians, which describes from a Persian point of view, um, the great Athenian victory at the Battle of Salamis. Aeschylus had actually fought in that battle um, and had also previously fought at the Battle of Marathon, in fact, about which he was extraordinarily proud. Um, now, the fact that the Athenians had won, the fact that the tragic figures who are losing their agency or losing control are the Persians made this a safe enough topic. Um, nonetheless, by and large, Athenian tragedians stick to myth, it's safe um, uh, uh, and is a way you can, you can deal with various themes and motifs and issues um, without necessarily angering a portion of the population. Um, now, in contrast, old comedy is a profoundly political exercise and it's hard to deny that that is fundamentally an aspect of uh, the Athenian democracy. Um, importantly, the, the flourishing of comedy come much, comes much later than the development and flourishing of tragedy. Um, uh, uh, it's, the first comedies are probably only added to the, the city Dionysia in the um, 480s um, and are not added to the Linnea until the, um, uh, the 450s or 440s. Um, so, uh, in some ways, the rise of comedy, the later rise of comedy, kind of actually corresponds with the Athenian democracy getting more radical. And comedy is fundamentally an, an art form that allows for rabid, ribald critique of various figures within the democracy. Um, so, there, in, in that sense, I would say that comedy is, is perhaps more democratic as a genre. Um, it is true that the democracy itself is very good at mobilizing the resources of Athenian society to support the arts. Um, uh, and indeed, uh, uh, the fact, an extraordinary amount of money and a not insubstantial portion of, the, uh, of, of Athenian resources go towards staging these shows. Um, now, uh, as I think I've discussed before, um, one way in which the Athenians fund these shows is through liturgies. So if you are a wealthy Athenian citizen, if you are really kind of in the Athenian 1%, you are a member of the liturgical class. And the democracy requires you um, to uh, fund, um, to, to engage in various activities. Um, a common one that we discussed and we talked about the Athenian navy was the triarchy where your job is literally to fit out a trireme for war. Um, but another liturgy that is very, very common and quite received is just to be a choragos, um, to be someone who organizes, actually serves as a producer of a dramatic festival, um, hires the playwrights, hires the dancers, provides the costumes, um, and uh, if you, if you uh, win the prize, um, you take home the tripod. Um, so in some ways, this is a way of mobilizing the elite to, in this instance, produce the shows that would provide the entertainment to the demos. Um, but this system is one reason why Athens becomes the center for dramatic production, even if there's other places that really enjoy those Greek tragedies. There's actually a, a system of mobilizing the elite to produce the plays, um, which is why the big playwrights are Athenians and are active, for the most part, in Athens itself. Um, now, uh, as I mentioned, there are really three festivals that are a major venue for these performances. Um, the first festival is actually dispersed, and that is the rural Dionysia. So 
Um, these plays don't just take place within the city center of Athens, within the Astu of Athens. Um, they're also performed all throughout the deans. Um, and indeed, um, uh, the sort of the first uh, big event on the calendar is the rural Dionysia. Um, you, maybe you might compare it to this is a, like the, the premiere in Boston before you, you move to Broadway. Um, and these deans actually devote substantial resources in some instances to main, maintaining theatrical facilities. The most famous and best preserved one is at Thorakos, um, a dean uh, near the mining region of uh, Lorion that because of the silver was a very wealthy dean and built a very early, actually, this is a, one of the earliest examples of a Greek theater that we have um, uh, uh, for the dean to enjoy. Um, and the fact that these deems are producing little plays across Athens also has an impact on how, again, kind of members of the demos network. Because if a deem like Thorkos is putting on a show as, as part of the rural Dionysia, it's not uncommon for people to come in from the outside, to come in from the city center, to come in from another deem and enjoy the show. Um, and so this is another way that Athenians from different parts of Athens can come together at what is a religious festival, mingle, get to know each other, and it creates a sort of stronger network within the citizen body. Now, after the various plays of the rural Dionysia, you then have the urban Dionysia, or sometimes called the city Dionysia, the Dionysia actually in uh, the, the Astu itself. Um, and uh, this is going to be a set of three plays um, uh, uh, and each set of plays actually consists of a tetralogy. So um, you'll have three tetra tetralogies throughout the city Dionysia. Um, uh, and uh, a tetralogy itself can be broken down into a trilogy of three plays followed by a satyr play. Um, the trilogy in some instances is interlocking. So in some instances, the trilogy will tell the same story. Um, uh, in some instances, it will actually just be three unrelated plays that the playwright has produced and just performs in a package like, um, you know, a double feature back in the day, except three plays. Um, so you'll get your trilogy of tragedies. And then the fourth play of the tetralogy is a sadder play. Um, and a sadder play actually seems to basically be like an almost... Um, riotous uh, comedy um, that allows people to blow off steam. We actually don't have any true satyr play that has performed that we can actually see with the, the dialogue, but it, but, it, but, it, but it seems that these are almost kind of like mimes, um, and they are populated by satyrs who are, uh, who are again, these um, uh, kind of half-animal creatures. They have big, ugly faces with balding heads, they have the ears of a horse. They have the tails of a horse. In some um, uh, depictions, they also have animal legs, although frequently they're shown with human legs. And this being Greece, they have strapped onto them um, large phalluses, um, which seem to have been props that they spend a lot of time manipulating. Um, and so it actually seems that you know one goal of experiencing a tetralogy is you would be given these three tragedies, which by and large are quite sad, by and large involve people who start the tragedy at the, at the top of the world and then are increasingly um, uh, beaten and bowed and, and not, uh, not infrequently killed. Um, and so you have these sort of three sad stories and then to kind of lighten things up at the end, you have this sadder play, um, which of course, again, a, a, a sadder is a figure closely associated with Dionysus, something, a, a figure that's liminal half human, half animal, and, and a figure who's strongly, the satyrs are, are, are strongly associated with the loss of sexual control. Um, hence, they have these huge phalluses and, and basically just want to sleep with everything. Um, uh, so in, in some ways, you kind of have this, this uh, it, it's a way of kind of lightening up after you've been watching these three sad stories, then you watch these satyrs uh, kind of tromping around stroking their fake phalluses and, and possibly engaging in some kind of, uh, of uh, kind of mime style lampoon. Um, so there will be three of these in the course of the city Dionysia. Um, and then at the end, um, there will be a vote to determine who wins the prize. 
Um, and this is kind of, you might say, an, a democratic element, um, although it's not a sort of pure vote like, say, American Idol, where everyone calls in and then they add up the votes and the, I think the majority wins. Um, rather, this is a vote with a number of aspects of chance built in. So jurors are nominated. There's 10 jurors. They're not the the uh, the actual jurors are picked by lot out of a out of a list that's nominated by the various tribes. So you then have the actual jurors are selected by lot. They then each get one vote, for which they think the best tri uh, tetralogy is. Um, they throw their vote into an urn, and then votes are drawn out of the urn and the first person to get to five votes wins first place. Um, so there's a lot of chance built in um, to, uh, to this sequence, um, uh, uh, even though there is this idea of kind of voting. And of course, the, the Athenians actually think chance and the lot is a actually surprisingly democratic way to make a decision. Um, and so with this sort of set of random events, um, a method is, this is the method by which you then determine who gets first place, second place, and third place. And again, it's for the tetralogy. So occasionally you'll see someone say, oh, you know, Euripides wrote this great play and came in third place. Well, they may have hated A, the, they may have just hated the tetralogy. Um, also, the votes were not just for the screenplay. They were actually voting for the entire thing. Um, it's somewhat similar to the way that Best Picture judges everything at the Academy Awards. Um, so they're voting for the costumes, the acting, the, the, the overall, um, uh, overall quality of the performance, and that, which, that's what determines your, um, your ranking. Um, nonetheless, the fact that you have this uh, essentially democratically facilitated competition also seems to drive your uh, productive output of plays, and, and is probably yet another reason why Athens becomes the center of dramatic production. Um, now, a couple of important things just to note about uh, tragedies, uh, Greek, Greek tragedies. They are fundamentally musicals. Um, uh, they are throughout accompanied by music, especially an instrument called an aulos, which is essentially like a, a double pipe. It produces a sound that may not be dissimilar to, say, what a Scottish bagpipe sounds like. Um, and in many instances, um, the... Um, Characters themselves break into song, um, both the main characters and also the chorus that, uh, that backs them. Um, and throughout there would have been not only aspects of singing, but aspects of dancing um, uh, that, that would have been part of the performance and part of the thing that the judges are, are uh, uh, considering as they try to determine um, the nature of, uh, of who wins. Um, so in some ways, ironically, we associate sort of musicals with comedy today. The idea you go to Broadway and see a musical comedy. For the Greeks, it's the tragedies that are musical, um, whereas the comedies are mostly just full of uh, dialogues, the comedies that don't have the same level of musical engagement. Finally, the theaters themselves were major public works that formed a really critical part of the overall urban topography. Um, now, a Greek theater um, consists of three basic parts. The first is the theatron. Um, the theatron is actually the, the, the seats, um, which are usually built into a hill. Um, in the center, um, surrounding the theatron, is the orchestra. Um, and while we today are trained to think of the orchestra as the place where the really good seats are, um, the orchestra is actually the primary performance space. That is where the uh, actors and dancers are actually primarily moving around. And then behind them is the skyna. That's where we get our term scene. Um, uh, the skyna can be a building that uh, actors can move in and, out on, uh, in and out of. And it also has a crane where in the event you have a deus ex machina, a god coming down from the machine, um, the god can be made to appear to hover 
over the Skyna, um, a very primitive version of a special effect. Um, now, uh, these, uh, this theater, uh, the, the, the Theater of Dionysus in Athens, is a huge theater. Um, you can go see it today, although you're seeing several layers of Hellenistic and Roman additions. Um, but again, this is important not simply as a place of performance, but again, of a place of community gathering. This is where citizens from all over Athens come together, mingle. Uh, it's a site of intervisibility. They can see one another. Um, and so therefore, coming together under these religious auspices to enjoy a tetralogy um, certainly does indeed have uh, both political and communitarian implications. So that's all for now. Again, I would welcome uh, questions uh, and comments. Um, I'll see you on Wednesday where we'll, we'll continue our discussion of aspects of Greek society and culture in the fifth century BC.